uh, get started. I was trying to figure out who had the most food in their mouth, and I was going to call on them to pray. <laughs> I, was, I was aiming towards Matt, but I decided to cut him some slack. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, thank you for gathering together in the name of Jesus. Thank you for the beautiful message from the covenant with Abraham and God. Uh, counted to, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Lord, faith in Christ is the way to meet the way. Help us to be open in our hearts and ears and understanding to receive what you have for us today. We pray through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Thank you. So, um, <laughs> it's kind of funny because I've... I've uh, really uh, dug in this past week because I know that what we're going to talk about can engender some strong responses from people. So I was, uh, I was thinking uh, Friday when we were at the Christwood, um, it's not a nursing home, I don't, hmm? assisted, living. assisted living home, uh, we were singing we have a beautiful time singing, but we were singing uh, Jesus, name above all names, beautiful Savior, glorious Lord. Um, what's the, oh yeah, I wrote it down. Uh, Emmanuel, God is with us, blessed Redeemer, living word. And it just made me think about all the things that we can get pretty tense about in our faith. And I thought, wow. If we would really think about what, who Jesus is, how could, how could we allow that to happen? We have to stand on truth, but all of us have to acknowledge that none of us know all the answers. None of us even really know all the questions. And we've all, we're all a, a slate upon which God has written a lot, but there's room for a lot more to be written. And so I, I invite us to, to realize that we can't, we can't grasp God in our hands or in our minds. If we could, he would not be God, almost by description, I would say. So very, very important topics, both of these, uh, the, the sovereignty of God and guarding the heart. Guarding the heart is hugely important. I hope we get to it. Uh, as we work through this other. So let me just start by saying that uh, I want to I get a few scriptures read. I'm going to read some, and I'm going to ask you to read some. Somebody turn and open to Genesis chapter 1, verse 31, and somebody turn to John chapter 1 and read verses 1 through 5. So obviously Genesis 1-1 says what? In the beginning, God. You could, you, I think it's appropriate to pause there for a minute. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth because in the beginning is God. So somebody read verse 31 from Genesis 1. How about it? God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was very good. And there was the evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. So can you imagine, using our divine imagination, I guess you could call it, what that might look like as God completed the creation of what even after all these years, we hadn't even seen, seen the end of it yet. We're seeing new things just in the last few months that have never been seen, so far as we know, other than by God. Uh, but, but he's looking at what he's created, and he said, it is very good. It is very good. What kind of picture does that paint? How, how do you see that God? Okay. 
powerful. I mean, it, it's so far beyond my imagination to try to even think of what that means, to, to speak into existence what we can't after thousands of years yet even really get our hands around uh, or our minds around. So someone read John 1, 1 through 5, please. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness overcame it not. Amen. And I'm going to read to you from 1 Chronicles, if you want to turn there and follow along. 1 Chronicles chapter 29, I'm going to read uh, verses 10 through 20 of 1 Chronicles 29. Therefore David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, Blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord, and you are exalted as head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. For we are strangers before you and sojourners as all our fathers were. Our days on the earth are like a shadow and there is no abiding. O oh Lord our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart I have freely offered all these things, and now I've seen your people who are present here offering freely and joyously to you, O Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, our fathers, forever such purposes and thoughts in the hearts of your people and direct their hearts towards you. Grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all, and that he may build the palace for which I have made provision. Then David said to all the assembly, Bless the Lord your God and all the assembly, Bless the Lord, the God of their fathers, and bowed their heads and paid homage to the Lord and to the King. <laughs> what, what, I mean, it's just so amazing to think about. But da David is recognizing that even, even these things that I'm giving you, I'm just giving you what was already yours. I'm giving you what you have given me. So we come to, to wrestle with, and maybe not wrestle with, this, this idea, this truth of the sovereignty of God. Sovereignty is a big word, uh, at least for a country boy, and it, it means that God's in control, period. God's in control. Sometimes we don't like to think that when what's being controlled doesn't go the way that we want it to go. But we either trust God for who he is or we turn and trust ourselves. And I know for sure that putting my trust in me is a huge mistake. And the truth is, it also is for each of us. It's not just me. So we, we can absolutely and, and we must absolutely trust God I heard a little story, I read a little story about two groups of people that were having this discussion about uh, the sovereignty of God and his decisions. 
and, a, and they were all together. And when they started talking about this, they divided into two groups. You had the, the free will people over here and you had the sovereignty of God's destination people over here. And there was one guy wandering and he came over to the sovereignty people and, and they said, how did you come here? He said, I just came on my own. They said, get back, you don't belong to us. He went over to the, go, they said, go to the other group. He went over to the free will group and they said, how did you come here? And he said, I was sent. And they said, get out of here, you don't belong here. <laughs> It, it's funny, because of my, my training, my background, I, I've dealt with a lot of extremely difficult circumstances, having to look at people and say things that they did not want to hear. And, and of course, half the time, some of the others do want to hear it. But it's kind of funny because I get, if, if Barney decides to call Juanita down at the diner instead of Thelma Lou, I get upset and leave the room. <laughs> I won't watch it because I don't like Barney to be unfaithful to, to Thelma Lou. And, and yet it, it doesn't bother me at all to, to walk into, it's just kind of strange. It's kind of strange. I don't know that that means anything to y'all, but I know my wife <laughs> understands what, um, it made me think about that, uh, that Jerry Reed song. He said, I'm going to take you out back of this courthouse and try a little of your honor on. <laughs> you hear that, you hillbilly, you redneck? Who's going to pay for my Cadillac? <laughs> <laughs> the sovereignty of God. Every single thing that exists and everything that happens is under the control of God. We, we in, in our Tuesday night men's group, have had some discussions, and I, I butted heads. Matt said we didn't, but inside I felt like I was butting heads, and I even apologized to him about, you know, this thing about God's permissive will and his intentional will and uh, his, his perfect will. And I don't think that any of us at least not anybody I've read or heard can get the fullness of that into our grasp. It, it's true. <laughs> you know, is it this or is it that? Yes. <laughs> it, it's both and. But God is, is sovereign over all things. So I want to read uh, from John chapter 1. We've started there, but we're going to move over to verse 11. And we're going to see, uh, not John 11, John 1, verse 11. John 1, verse 11 through 14. He, speaking of Jesus, came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. What do you see there? that speaks very strongly of the sovereignty of God. It's all God. Okay. Any, anything specific anybody wants to observe that, that speaks strongly to you of the sovereignty of God from, from God these... Okay. allow things to happen before it happens. So before us, so before everything, he even leaves our sin works to the good. Yeah. That's all. All knowing. Nick? In you know, verse 12 kind of jumps out after we talk about God's sovereignty. 
uh, that he gave them the right to become children of God, even to those that believe on his name. That, that, that kind of jumped, jumped on it. It did, me too. It's kind of hard to miss that, Steve. He's in control of everything, no exceptions. Okay. And is anybody wrestling with that, the sovereignty of God, that, that he is ultimately in control? Frank doesn't agree. Yeah. <laughs> I have a comment. And basically you said he's all-knowing and all-believing, all-knows everything. He knew that his people would reject his son. Amen. So right here, they did not receive him. Yeah. That was a surprise. It's, it's hard for us to get this in our mind, but before the foundation of the world, God knew Frank and that he would sing that song with his guitar in church at Mandeville Bible Church this morning. Now, my mind can't take that in fully, but, but it's just as true as, as all the other things. Uh, however, what does... But to all who did receive him, how do you receive him? We talk about it every Sunday. By faith. What does that require of you, Chris? Trusting in the person of Jesus. Okay. We just read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. By grace, through faith, this not of yourselves. So what, what is your part in that? My part is, is faith alone. There's nothing I can do to earn it. It's a, it's a gift of God, as the scripture says. And I believe somebody read uh, John six forty four. If I'm, I'm hope I'm remembering the right verse. I don't, I don't have that written down in my notes. Read. It. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up. So even, even our receiving is preceded by God's drawing, right? So no, no one, no one can, so there's not anybody in here that's in Christ that has done that except that God first enabled by, by drawing us. Yet it does say in here, and, and as Chris said, who I, I like to say it like this I'm leaving the scripture but but I would say that you know if God was giving me this bell my only part is to receive it I could just put my hands in my pockets and let it fall to the floor my but I have to do that so there is some involvement but it's all from God and we have to to take into our hearts and minds that even though we can't explain it, it doesn't mean that it's not from God or that it's not true. Because there's a lot of things that in God's economy that we accept and we can talk about them. Who has ever explained to you the Trinity at a level where you said, oh, that's crystal clear and I understand all aspects of it? When I really got fired up about Jesus in 1987, I had three different major life-changing events in 1987, and by the fall, I said, you know, Lord, you may be telling me something. Um, I came that close to dying three times that year, and I said, yeah, it's time for me to wake up here. But anyway, I got, I got in there, and, you know, and I knew about the Trinity in my Ears, but I didn't really know about it in my heart in the sense I'd ever studied it. And I said, all right, that's the first thing I'm going to do. I'm going to figure this trinity out. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read the Bible. I'm going to do this. Well, that's been, uh, how long has it been since 1987? 13, uh, 36 years ago. Um, I'm not any closer today than I was then. So we have to understand that there I don't remember who I first heard use this 
term about God's economy, but I like that term. In God's economy, in God's way of doing things as he shows us in his word, there are things that, that seem to be opposites. Can you think of one that's in God's word, he says one thing, but in our world economy, it's completely different. Yes, Mary. Um, I, I'm, I, he's a good guy. You know, or the, the, they are good people, but the Bible says no one's good. Yeah. Yeah. That's a real, he's a fella. His heart is desperately wicked. Who can know it? <laughs> Of, of whoever is the best, quote, end quote. All right? What's another thing that just... The first will be last and the last will be first. Yeah, absolutely. How does that? How can the first be last? How can the last be first? Do, can you explain that? I can't explain. No, none of us can explain it. The, the, the highest place we can achieve is to be at the feet of Jesus. To fall at the feet of Jesus is the highest place we'll ever attain to. To be a servant. How many people do you, if we went out on the street today and said, all the servants come over here through a bullhorn, how many people do you think would respond to that? <laughs> Nobody. They would, they would think you're crazy. There's no greater thing on earth than to be a servant of Jesus. I mean, it, it's just exciting. It's, it's like, wow, yeah, I get to be. How did, how did I get to do this? And it's weird how that gives you so much joy. You Isn't know, it? You, think of, you would never think that as a, as a normal thinking person, that that would be the joy that you feel from the serving of God. Isn't that beautiful? It is. Paul's, Paul's letterhead says servant. <laughs> A bond servant, a doula slave of Jesus Christ. You know, Matt, have you ever received a letterhead from a lawyer that said, I'm a servant of anybody? I have not. <laughs> I, I had also, neither. Also, when I'm watching the U.S. Open this afternoon, do not expect that during the Cadillac commercial, they'll say, blessed is the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, Clay. <laughs> Way back 150 years ago, people used to sign their name and say, you're obedient servant. Well, yeah, they, yeah, they, they did. They did. We're not going to do all of those things. Yeah. That, I f thank you for reminding me. I love looking at old letters, and I've seen, uh, you know, your obedient servant, your, what, you know, whatever. Yeah, that's a great, great reminder. So we have to embrace the fact that, that God's economy is different and that, that he just doesn't do things like, like we do. What do we often say when we, don't, when we don't really grasp what's going on? We'll say something like what? To express our feeling about it. What are some things you've said or heard other people say? If you don't want to confess on yourself, you can say, I heard somebody else say it. <laughs> Like, I just don't believe God would do it that way. This doesn't make sense to me. It isn't fair. It isn't fair. How many times have you heard that? How many? Yeah, said it. Me too. Or you hear that there's too much evil in the world. And it's, it's the sovereignty of God. It, it, we don't think God can do it, then our view of God is too small. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. When my mother-in-law passed away several years ago, I put this way, I never seen somebody such on fire for God. She had like seven, eight nursing home ministries she went to sing at. Okay. And she got terminal cancer. She was really suffering. And my father-in-law, who actually turned away Christ on his deathbed, <clears throat> He says, how can God do this to her? She's been so faithful. She's done all these things. How can he let this happen? How can he do this to her? And my wife and I are Christians, and my mother-in-law says, Lord, well, I don't know. But yet, she still sat there. I played with her. She says, Lord, I don't know why you keep me here this long. 
around the days of reason. And my father Mark, he just couldn't understand. And I don't think anybody that Doc was the preacher she worked with could understand why does it happen? You know what the answer is? I don't know. Well, the things of God make no sense to the th people of the world. It's just, it just, they, they don't click together. So let me, let me read uh, from Matthew chapter 11. Matthew 11, I'm going to read verses 25 to 28. Matthew 11. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and anyone the Son chooses to reveal him. And then he says, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I mean, as, as crystal clear as he can possibly say it, he said, this is impossible for anybody to come except that I do this. And then he turns around and says, come to me, all you who are labor. And that's really, that's really the call that, at least in my heart, that, that I think Jesus is crying to all of us not just to be saved, yes, for that, but come to me today. Come to me in this Sunday school hour. Come to me during the, the worship service. Come to me while you're driving home. He's calling us because more and more we need to come to him. We need to hear his, his call. Amen? Amen. That's just, just so powerful to me. Let's get off of Barney there. Oh, this is just something I wrote down. If you, I, I didn't make a handout. I don't know if you want a chance to, to write that down. That's got some good information on it. Is it too small to read? Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, if you want to take a picture. Uh, this is not really part of the lesson per se, but but it was something when I was studying this morning that I had in some notes and I wrote it down. It, it not, I didn't come up with it, so I'm not claiming any ownership. God is sovereign over all, or he's not God at all. Now that's not a quote out of scripture, but that to me is a solid spiritual truth that that if we can't see the sovereignty of God just from the very cup, first couple of verses we read where it says, you know, he created in the beginning God, we could stop there. But, but all of the, you know, the, the, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. All of these things just cry out to us that God is sovereign over all. I think it's a safe proposition to say he couldn't be God if he wasn't sovereign over all. And to be all-knowing and all-powerful and unchanging and ever-present, that answers the question, you know, that, that he is sovereign over all. Yet we still have our part. We still have our part, and that part creates some confusion on my part, and I suspect I'm not the only one. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. We're just going to look at two verses there. Verse 4. Somebody read verse 4. Ephesians 1 verse 4. Chose us in him before creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight and in his love. Yeah. And then verse 11, someone please. Oh, 
also we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose who works all things after the counsel of his will. Did you finish the verse? I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 11. Yeah, okay. Okay. So, this, this is where we could hit that wall and divide into to groups here. But, you know what? My, Jesus said in John chapter 17, He said, Father, my prayer is that they, us, would be one just as the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are one. That's referred to by people, not in Scripture, as the high and holy prayer of Jesus. And I see it that way as, as the, the ultimate end of, of what we're doing is for us to be one because there will be a day when we will be one when he comes back and the, the bride of Christ will be joined to the bridegroom. And so that, that's what I would call the ultimate end of that. And I say that because it's important. God said it's important, but I said it to say this. There are in smart, serious Bible students in this room and in, throughout this world, and some of them think this clearly means that God decided all this ahead of time, and that's the way it is. And some think that this means that God knew ahead of time that this is what would happen, and that's what he's saying. And then there's some variations on that. We're not going to solve that debate. That has gone on for centuries. But here's what I think, my, my heart plea following up on, one, on what Jesus says, is when we come to some, when, when we know that there's only one name given by which we may be saved, when we know that there's one God eternally existing as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, when we know that the Word of God is just that, it's not the Word of man, it's the Word of God, in, in errant in its totality. And, and we know that it's by grace alone, through faith alone, and I could go on, but you see where I'm going. When we, when we know these common foundational things, I think, this is just, this is my thinking, but it's based on Jesus' prayer that we ought to be humble enough and honest enough to say, I don't have all the light there is to shine on this, all the spiritual light. Why don't we walk hand in hand spiritually and be open to see what God may show us different than what we think now? <coughs> God's not changing. God doesn't change. His word's not going to change. Truth isn't going to change. But because we are sinners and because whatever comes into our mind, it comes through the filter of all the things we've experienced in life. And, and those are things that, that cause us not to embrace the truth always exactly as it, as it is. Or, or maybe you have the truth on that, but maybe you don't on something else. But be willing to humbly say, we want to stand on the Word of God. We don't want to move even one iota off of that. We don't want to, we don't want to let society or the changing times, which aren't changing, they're just old, old heresy, old sin renewed, uh, to, to move us off of truth but we don't have to be in a battle with each other while we're work, walking through this world. And, and if you know, we come to that spot where it just feels like that we're just being pulled apart, then, then we can sit down and ask God to help us see the, the next step. I love that in, I think I mentioned, I may have even mentioned this last week, but I love the, the picture of... Um, uh, the, the word from Psalm 119, my mind just went blank. Psalm 119, thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. They didn't have Q-beams 
at that time. I don't know if y'all knew that, but they didn't. And so they would have something like a torch or a lantern, and it wouldn't light any more than my first step, probably. Huh? Didn't what you said? A spotlight. Oh, okay. A Q beam is a type of spotlight that's got shine two miles or whatever. But this just shows us one step. Let's just take that one step, trusting completely in God and being open to seeing what God shows us where the next step is. And, and not have to be right, knowing that God is right. Who, what did Jesus say when he said, good teacher? He said, only God is good. So none, none of us uh, fit that fit that description. I certainly don't, and, and none of us do, if we'll be truthful. Am I making sense? I can say amen and thank you for that. So we're just, I'm going to leave this, but I want to make sure nobody misunderstands. We're not changing anything, and we're not, we're not saying that anyone should move off of what God has said, but just be humble enough to admit that we don't know all things and that God is still teaching us. It's a process called sanctification. And how long does it last? All our lives. Uh, until we meet Jesus, right? So. I'd like to say something. Yes, sir. You know, a lot of times when God tells you to move or go speak to this person, you know, you can either do it or miss a blessing. Yeah, amen. And I don't know if you say the movies, Raiders of the Lost Ark. Probably, I don't remember. Yeah, well, it comes to the sheriff, and uh, when you look at it, it's, you know, a big drop. And he says that you, if you make your first step, then you'll see a bridge across there. So when you look at it, it looks like there's no way I'm going to cross it. But when you put that first foot out and step on that, then you see a, a, a bridge that goes all the way across there. But the object is that you make, make that first step. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Amen. That's good. That's good. So, Hollis, I go to the scripture in Deuteronomy, it's 29, 29. I was going to land there in a little bit. Go, no, 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 I want you to read it. Read it. The secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but those things which are revealed belong to us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. Amen. So he revealed some things, and just like with the disciples, yeah. When he was telling them of his death, it wasn't revealed to them yet. They responded. Yeah. But the truth that we do know and what we do understand. Amen. We stand a, a footnote to that is, and I'm not going to even call his name, but a famous football player from a generation ago, quarterback that was much respected, he. I, I'm divorced, so I'm not putting down on him. I'm not divorced. I'm married, but I have been. And, and so uh, that didn't come out too well, did it? <laughs> it's all of the above. <laughs> I'm a little bit flustered. <laughs> uh, he said, God just showed me he wanted me to be happy, and so he wanted me to marry this other we have to be real careful when God gives us a vision because if it's God's vision, it's going to come out of God's word. It's going to line up perfectly with it. It's not going to, it's not going to deviate from it. So, amen. But I get nervous when, if, if I'm teaching and I'm going to tell you something I think, I say, I'm leaving the Bible and I'm going to tell you what I think. But everything I say, you need to check it against Scripture. We all have that responsibility to each other to make sure that, that we stay on the path. So this is a picture uh, of, I think it's about a 13 and a half hour, well, it's not a picture of a 13 and a half hour flight, but it's a picture inside a very large jet when I was between the United States and Doha, Qatar, 
And I thought about while I was working on this, how this seems to be a good description of how, now let me back up. It's not a good description, but it's, a, it's a, an example that lends some insight to this thing about the sovereignty of God and free will. That's a long time to stay in the air, almost 14 hours, and I'm fidgety anyway. And so uh, getting up and moving as often as I could was one of my favorite things to do. And I was free. That's me. <laughs> I, I was free to move. Well, there was a certain place forward we couldn't go where the, where the big guys sat. But, but other than that, I was free to move around. But I didn't have any control over anything. They were in control. You see what I'm saying? So we, we have freedom. I, I don't really think free will is really the right word because if it were free will, then it would be our will for everything. For example, I didn't decide when I would be born. I didn't decide to whom I would be born or what continent I would be born on or any of those things. And every day in Colossians 1, 16, I think he says in him, we live and move and have our being. In John 15, he says, apart from him, we can do nothing. So even the breath that we're breathing right now and even the beat of our heart is a gift from God. So how, how foolish would I look to run around saying what an independent person I am and I did this and I did that. If I did anything that was good, it was a gift from God. If, if it wasn't good, then it was me getting in the way of God. But you see what I'm saying about how you have that freedom of sorts, but it's not, it's not truly that, that we can determine the outcome. If it sounds complicated to you, you're in really good company. People way, 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 way smarter than me, which is most people, uh, have struggled with this forever, using that term loosely a little bit. In Psalm 147.5, great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. Psalm 147.5, his great is our Lord and abundant in power. His understanding is beyond measure. When, when we allow humility to catch up with us and we embrace the greatness of God and the, you know, what are some of the ways we're referred to our life? Uh, in James, it says, what are you? You are a mist. You know, you're like the, the uh, flowers of the field that today are here and tomorrow are gone. Our, our lives are short. I mean, it seemed like about six weeks ago I was 10 years old, but <laughs> it really does. I mean, it, it seems so recent, you know, but it isn't, is it? I, I don't look like I'm six weeks over 10, do I? <laughs> I don't think so. God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, say this to the people of Israel. I am has sent you. Uh, that's Exodus 3.14. Psalm 92, before the mountains were brought forth or ever you had formed the earth and the world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Do you remember what, uh, what God said back to Job? Where were you, Job, when I put the, the limits on the oceans and where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Very... Um, very much over our ability to take in, but by faith we receive what, God's given us what we need. It, it was like uh, Chris said in his sermon, he said, if the word's not there, it's because God knows you didn't need it. If you needed it, the word is there. And so the fact that we have this struggle is not something we should be anxious about. It's, it's just a picture of how glorious God is and, and reminds us of how awesome he is. When we were talking about those, um, those uh, things that are kind of confounding, one of them that we didn't mention, I don't think, is Jesus fully God and fully man. 
He was absolutely God, but he was absolutely man. It's another thing that we can't, we can't explain that. Um, so let me just stop and see if there are any questions that I can get somebody else to answer for you about the sovereignty of God. You know, I was thinking about what you saw, what you read about in the Deuteronomy, but you know the, the letters from Paul to the churches said that he was revealing a mystery of God, which was, the Gentiles would be part of the uh, redemption. And so that's just one mystery. Yeah. And it does it, he did reveal it. Yeah. But doesn't, you know, there's probably so many mysteries just like this that will never be fully revealed. Especially, I don't think there's any new prophets or any new apostles going to come around. Uh, so, yeah, we're, we're faced with that dilemma that, yeah, we're going to have to understand that, you know, there are things that are revealed and there's things that are not revealed. And the unity of Christians is to understand that. And there was a man that I met that was strict Calvinist, and, and at the time I didn't, I didn't even know anything about that. And he started telling me about that stuff, and I was just like, I, I, I just can't believe God's that way. <laughs> so, I'm, I'm guilty. I've said that <laughs> many times. He was saying, well, I'm saying, well, what if a, a baby's born and he's Supposedly, I show it and well, he's going to hell. And I'm like, what? Wow! I can't deal with that. But he did say one thing that just made me feel better about it. He says, but if somebody believes differently, I don't have a problem with that as long as they believe in the basis of, you know, what we have four beliefs. So, that's. Well, the, the, I'm going to come back to you, Frank. We're running close on time. It, so, it you beautifully led into the to the next scripture which is well known to us Proverbs 3 5 and 6 but add to it 7 and 8 trust in the Lord with all your heart do not lean on your own understanding in all your ways acknowledge him in our in our uh, ability to not know everything our inability to know everything to acknowledge him and he will make straight our paths he'll give us what we need he's already given it to us he's given us the holy spirit to guide us through the through the minefield so to speak be not wise in your own eyes fear the lord i'm talking to me y'all may get something out of this but be not wise in my own eyes fear the lord turn away from evil it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Do your bones feel refreshed? I, they, they do. They do. We were talking about that this morning in prayer, weren't we? About um, about the, you know just how God does things that that are that are so wonderful. So we have to trust God, not our circumstances. Every one of us are going to say. Why in the world did that happen? Especially if it involves a child. But but a lot of things confound us. But if it involves a child, then we're just we're just it, it just washes over us. What did we sing? What was the last song we sang? No, uh, it is well. Is it wasn't the last? I'm sorry, it wasn't the last. But you know, the guy that wrote that, uh, Horatio Spafford, wrote that after losing two of his children. He said, you know, when uh, peace like a river attendeth my soul, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. And so maybe, this is a big maybe, but maybe some of the things that God, that we see as things we wish were clear to us, or God given us an opportunity to ex to take that uh, that one step that you were talking about, you know, to take that step to trust God, to know that we don't have to know it, we don't have to understand it. We can and we must trust God. How many hours, weeks, months, years have we spent worrying about things that we were not benefited by it at all, instead of trusting God and something like 90 plus percent of the time, the whole thing we were worrying about wasn't even, wasn't even a thing. 
It, didn't even, it wasn't even real. It was just something we thought was going to be real. But even when it was real, you know, we can sit over here and worry and be anxious, or we can stand over here in the joy of the Lord and say, I don't understand it. I don't like it. I wish it wasn't happening, but I trust you. And your viewpoint is way ahead of mine. Let me, let me see what Frank had. I think probably in, I'll probably say this. I'm an, an all-knowing God created man, created man. And before he created him, no one even thought. Now it just doesn't, it's so hard to understand that. Why would he do it? Now it's just hard to understand that. Yeah. Um, well, I would, I would love to answer that question like I knew. I, I don't know, but, but I do know that God didn't want to create, uh, well, I think from what God shows us about himself, he would not have wanted to create us as robots that are going to do what, what you know, the robot says rather than uh, to love him. He's been in a love relationship eternally, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we're pretty much out of time. I ain't even touched. I thought that might happen guarding, guarding the heart. That, the, yeah. Why, why, one simple thing. God's walk by faith, not by sight. The standard what messes us up. <laughs> and guess what? Faith is what pleases our God. Yeah, so amen. So walk by faith and not by sight. Don't get all this. I'm, I'm going to bring back, if the Lord's willing, I'm going to bring back, bring us back to guarding your heart because I, I don't, I mean, the sovereignty of God is one of the most important things we can grasp to ourselves and the need to guard our hearts, especially in the world we're living in today, is so, so important. And I think there are probably some things that we may be allowing ourselves to be invaded by that we're not even really thinking about. And I hope not. I hope you're way ahead and you've got all those things in place. But I think knowing about guarding our heart is, is that important. We've got a few more weeks to work on this. If we could stay on this Christian maturity until whenever, and we'd never run out of something to talk about. So we'll, we'll just hit what we can in the six or seven weeks, whatever it is that we got. Yes, ma'am. You know what I've kind of thought about? It's like God don't make us robots, but he gives us a heart to reveal what's in our heart. And that could be good or bad sometimes. But if he made us robots, we would just not make any decisions. Amen. Yeah. Isn't the heart a beautiful gift? I, is there anybody in here that's never had your heart broken? No, we, we all have, but, but we can still say what a beautiful gift God gave us. The ability to care, to love, to, to want to seek him. I, I don't find any reason to, I mean, I couldn't question him anyway, but I certainly don't from, from that. So, amen. Thank y'all. Uh, Do you have something? I'm sorry. Don't, don't break our hearts. Maybe next week we can't hear most of what the speaker, we're not taking away from the speakers when they, different people have things to say. But since they're talking to you, when we went back here, we just came here. I'm saying that because as, as a famous rock star used to say, I know I'm not that unique. <laughs> I think there might be some other people who are not here in either. Okay, you're not able to hear me. No, we can't hear what she was Oh, saying. okay. All right, well, I apologize. So next week, Lord willing, Let's speak up, maybe even stand up, uh, but just, just make sure that people can hear us. You might have to, to repeat, the question. repeat the question. Good, good idea, good idea. Should have been obvious, but I didn't think about it. Yeah, I hate watching those uh, post-game things when the, the coach is sitting there and he's nodding his head. <laughs> you don't have a clue what they're saying. Then he starts giving an answer. So I apologize, Clay. I didn't, I didn't think I had become what I didn't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
Uh, Steve, would you would you pray for us to close? Father, we uh, are humbled by the uh, picture that Scripture paints of you uh, as the sovereign, most high, and majestic God. Um, and we, we honor that, and we um, submit to the fact that you're bigger than our minds can bear. And uh, that uh, just makes us, uh, puts us in the right, in the right position. Uh, Father, we uh, thank you for the, the time that uh, Hollis spent in this, uh, studying this, and, uh, and the way that he presented it. And um, we all recognize that, that uh, not only did we, did we fall short of the glory, but we also fall short in the brain power to comprehend you. Uh, Lord, we uh, thank you again for Hollis, for the class, for the church, for our pastor, his wife, and uh, all you bless us with in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Amen.